My name's Andrew Taylor, and I was a round-the-world crew member on the Derry, London Derry Dora racing yacht, taking part in the Clipper Round the World Yacht Race 1314. Just over a year ago, we were mid-North Pacific on race 10 of the 16-race, 11-month, 47,000-mile Round the World series. We were racing from Qingdao in China across to San Francisco on the west coast of North America. We crossed the international date line the day before, and we were now at 179 degrees west. The weather was closing in on us, getting progressively worse, or as we referred to it when we were on the boat, tasty. Sean McCarter, the skipper, and I were discussing a sail change as the weather was closing in and we clearly needed less canvas. We decided that we would change our sails down and that there was a requirement to change the head sails, which Sean and I agreed to do together. We headed up onto the foredeck and took our respective positions up on the bow, ready to unhank a Yankee that was already dropped. This was something Sean and I had done many times before. We were comfortable working together. We knew each other well. We'd been sailing together for eight months. We knew what we needed to do, and we just wanted to get on and get it done. We'd already been on deck for about five hours. We were both cold. We were both hungry. And we joked together about needing a cup of tea and looking forward to a hot lunch. It was about 11.30 in the morning. We ran into difficulty fairly quickly. One of the brass hanks was virtually impossible to get open, and we tried as much as we could together, and we couldn't open it. And I indicated to Sean, unable to speak to him because of the noise of the wind and the waves crashing over us, that I would go and get some tools to help. As I knelt down and turned round to leave the foredeck, there was another crew member behind me who asked where I was going. I indicated I needed some tools, and he said, I'll go get them. And off he went. I stood up, turned around, about to continue with the sail change with Sean, and at that time, just exactly as I stood up, we were hit by an enormous wave from one side. And the boat rocked, the wave came over the deck, and when the boat came back up, I wasn't on board anymore. One of the things that still shocks me about the incident is just how quickly this happened. There was no moment's loss of balance. There was no opportunity to steady myself or reach out and grab anything or even make a noise. The boat rolled, my feet left the deck, and I was in the water. One second I'm on the boat, the next second I'm underwater. It happened just in a blink of an eye. I resurfaced and I braced myself, grabbing hold of my life jacket, expecting my safety line to snag, and I felt this rush of water. Assuming that that was my safety line dragging me behind the boat, I took a breath and held, held tight, expecting to be dragged along, one of my worst fears. I realised very quickly, as I saw this flash of purple at the side of the boat rushing past me, that I was no longer connected. And as I realised this, I was hit by the rudders, standing proud of the water as I'd gone off the high side. The rudders ran me over, over the top of my legs, spun me round and put me back under water. And as I resurfaced, the pain was excruciating, and I watched the boat disappear into the waves in the distance, gone in a, in a second. It was still travelling at full racing speed, and it left me alone very quickly. I felt, I felt disappointed at that point. The shock of the cold water had kind of passed by that moment, and I watched as the boat disappeared, and I felt disappointed that I'd fallen off. I felt disappointed that I'd become disconnected. And I was overwhelmed by the silence on a racing yacht when the wind and waves are crashing down on you, and you're, you're cracking along at 20-plus knots. It's always noisy. There's always stuff going on around you. And I suddenly realised it was actually quite quiet, despite it being in the middle of a North Pacific storm in 20 to 30 metre waves and 60 mile an hour wind. It actually felt pretty quiet. The boat had disappeared from sight. I checked my life jacket over and made sure that I was fully inflated, made sure that I was stable in the water. I reached down and was pleased to find my AIS still attached to the strop that I'd attached it to prior to leaving Qingdao. I lifted it up. I felt slightly smug that it was attached to my life jacket. And I had a little look at it. I remember thinking when I purchased it that it wasn't a particularly expensive item, and that at the time I hoped I'd never have to rely on it. 
but for what was a particularly small cost in comparison to racing a yacht around the world for a year, it was now going to become something very special. I pulled out the pin, turned the big orange knob in the direction of the white arrow that said twist. It started flashing, and I felt good about where I was and what was about to happen. I've trained for Man Overboard. We've trained for it religiously for the last year and a half as part of our race training and since we left London some eight months earlier. I know how this works. I've been through this. We've trained this. The boat stops. It turns around. It comes back to my position. They take a note of where the tides are rushing and which way the wind's blowing. They work out where I am and pick me up. In clip around the world yacht race history, in the 20 years that the race has been running, there have only ever been two man overboards before. They were both recovered in nine and 12 minutes, respectively. I didn't feel concerned. I expected the boat to turn around, come back, pick me up, because we've done that. We've done it with dummies many, many times. This is straightforward. I know how this works. I've settled myself down and kept an eye out for the boat, trying to see it, wondering at this point whether my legs were broken because the pain was becoming unbearable. Looking around, I couldn't see the boat. I never saw it. The time ran on. I got increasingly cold. The cold started to get into me. I could feel my body aching. I could feel myself struggling to stay conscious. I had no concept of time. I never looked at my watch, deciding that that was potentially demotivational. You know how you look at your watch? And you look at it again half an hour later, and actually it's only two minutes. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to know how long I'd been in the water. It wasn't relevant. What I needed to do was stay alive, stay focused. I knew what people on the boat would be doing. What I needed to do was be ready when they got back. The time rolled on. I continued to get colder and colder. I was drifting in and out. I knew I was struggling. I was thinking of friends and family back home. There were all kinds of things that ran through my mind. This wasn't a kind of life flashes past you because I had a lot of time to think about stuff. I thought about my daughter and I started thinking about the plans I'd put in place for her back home. I thought about the contents of my will. I thought about the organisation for my funeral, all of which were in order and, and left just in case at home. And then I started thinking, oh, hang on a minute, this is not a good way to survive. This is not stuff to think about. This is not how, how I want to stay focused. This is not what I need to do. From nowhere, I remembered it was my mum's birthday. I remembered I hadn't sent her anything yet. I was going to try and use a sat phone to send her a text or an email and wish her a happy birthday, and I hadn't done this yet. It gave me great strength remembering Mum's birthday. I decided I wasn't going to die on her birthday. That would be unfair. And I decided at that point, this is not going to happen. It gave me an enormous amount of strength and really helped me focus. As time passed, it became increasingly difficult to stay focused and to stay alert. I stopped shivering. I didn't feel cold. I didn't feel scared. I actually felt quite happy, almost slightly euphoric. I realised from my training, from both from mountaineering in my past and in sailing around the world, that this is a bad place. This was the advanced stage of hypothermia. Hypothermia is talked about as quite a nice way to die. You're not scared. You're not frightened. You settle down. You become euphoric. You become happy and you go to sleep. It's not a bad way to die. The body's very good at dying. The body knows how to die. We all have the capability of staying alive. None of us know how we're going to react. I had done my sea survival training. I knew how to manage myself in the water in a life jacket. But being in the middle of the Pacific, in the middle of the storm, is a whole different ball game. There is no way to train for that. and Nobody knows how they're going to behave until they actually experience it. At some point, I thought I heard voices. I wasn't sure. My mind playing tricks on me. I'm looking around. I still can't see the boat. I can catch a fleeting glimpse of the mast once or twice. I knew that that meant that the boat had stopped. I knew that it meant they were looking for me. I saw somebody up the mast. That gave me a massive, massive lift. That means they're looking for me. Absolutely. But it also means they don't know where I am. Otherwise they wouldn't be looking. They'd be coming to pick me up. I wondered why this was. I've got my AI speaking. I've turned it on. They know where I am. It'll show up on the screen, won't it? Then I started to think, I don't know what it looks like on the screen. I've never done this before. I've never turned an AIS on before. I don't know what happens. Does it make a noise? Does it show up on the screen? Will they know where I am? Is anybody looking for it? Everyone on the boat knows I've got an AIS, so surely they'll check the screen. But does it make a noise? I don't know. 
I should know this. We should have trained this. I looked at the AIS, and for some reason, and I still to this day don't know why, I turned it off, and I turned it back on again. And when I did, it flashed differently. And I looked at it, and I looked at it again, and I found a small blue legend near the on-off switch that explained to me what the flashes meant. I'm a bloke. I didn't read the instructions. I just picked it up, took it out of the box, and attached it to my life jacket, thinking, this is good, I've got an AIS, I'll be safe. I should have read the instructions. I should have tested it. I should have known how it worked. I hadn't done this. I should have done, and I recommend people to do it in the future. So my AIS is flashing differently. There's nothing else I can do now, and I settled down. I tried to stay cold, to stay awake, but there's nothing I can do. I need to really dig deep now to try and stay alive. I hear those voices again. I'm sure my mind's playing tricks on me now, and I'm in a bad place, and I tell myself, come on, guys, stay awake, stay alive. This is ridiculous. And I turn myself around in the water. I hear the voices again, and I can see the boat. It's bearing down on top of me, and my initial thought is, Jesus, enormous. Very few people get to see a 73-foot racing yacht from that angle, in that condition, and being underneath it, when it comes down off the top of a wave, it's not a good place to be, and I felt scared. For the first time in very nearly two hours in the water, I felt scared, and I was scared that the boat was back, and I was scared that the boat was going to run me down. I saw my colleague Jason Middleton in the water, He'd got a safety harness and he was attached to a halyard and he was down in the water with me. We made eye contact. We wrapped our arms around each other and we tried to start the recovery. He had a helicopter strop in his hand and he tried to put it around me and I tried to help him. Both of us were cold. Both of us were weak. Neither of us could do it. We tried to fix it to the strops and fix it onto the clips for the halyards so that we could be lifted out of the water. Both of us failed. It all fell apart. The helicopter strop came off me, I fell back in the water, and the boat went round again, and made its figure of eight pattern to come back to me. I watched as the boat disappeared. I saw Skipper smiling as it went past. It made its figure of eight, came back to me in the water, and we tried for the second time. As it came to me in the water, I ended up the wrong side of the bow, at one point hanging onto the bobstay as the bow of the boat was chopping down on the water on top of me, and I was convinced was at one point it was going to land on top of me. Again, I felt scared for the first time in the water. The boat goes round for a third time, and as it leaves me for the third time, I really start to wonder if I've got enough strength to do this now. I've used everything I can on the first two attempts. I don't know if I've got anything left, and I'm limp and lifeless in the water. I try and hold my safety line up in the water and hold it above the surface. I struggle to find the strength to do it. I try to turn myself in the water with my arms and legs, and exactly the same, I struggle to find the strength to do it. And I start to shout at myself and talk to myself in my head. Come on, matey. You need to focus now. You need to sort this out. You need to get out of this. This is your last chance. You're not going to get another go. This is third time now, third time lucky. And I pump myself up like a sportsman about to enter a sports field. And I start to get myself wound up and get myself excited and get myself ready. The boat comes around for a third time. And as it does, I've got my safety line in my hand and I'm holding it up. And as the boat comes next to me, Jason grabs the safety line, puts his arms around me again, and we hang on to each other. We both fumble with a safety line and fumble and fiddle with a clip, trying to get it clipped onto his halyard. Neither of us can do it. We're too cold. We're too weak. We're getting smashed around by the boat. And then I hear the clip shut. It snaps shut. It's a noise I'll never, ever forget. Now I think I'm in, good, I'm in a good place. I'm now connected to the boat for the first time in nearly two hours. I'm reconnected. And as I get reconnected, the boat rolls. And as it rolls... The halyard snaps taut and lifts us both up out of the water and we crash headfirst against the side of the boat. No sooner is it rolled over, but it rolls back. It dumps me in the water and it dumps Jason in the water on top of me and I go under. I've just gone under and tried to take a breath and my safety line snaps tight again as the boat rolls back and it lifts me back out of the water. This happens over and over and over again. Every time I come up, I struggle to get a breath. And as I struggle to get a breath, I go back in the water and with Jason back on top of me again. We're getting smashed around, connected to the top of the mast on the end of a halyard. It's a really bad place to be. And for the first time now, I think I'm going to drown. At some point, I don't go under again. And I just crash against the side of the boat. And I feel hands getting hold of me and dragging me up onto deck. Those hands grab me, drag me onto deck. 
pull me over into the cockpit and stuff me into a sail bag. Half a dozen people pick me up, shove me down the companionway and pull me downstairs into the saloon. It's all over in a second. It happened so quickly. Everyone had had plenty of time to get ready. Susie Redhouse, our boat medic, is calling the shots. She's telling everybody what to do. My kit's being cut off by three or four people with scissors. Everything's being pulled around. In moments, I'm naked. I'm shoved into a sleeping bag. And the water drinks bottles that everybody's been using on the trip so far have been collected up, filled up with hot water and wrapped in towels, socks, anything people can find to make little mini hot water bottles. And a sleeping bag that I'm in is filled up with these. For the next four hours, I drift in and out of consciousness while I'm trying to raise my body temperature back up to some kind of normality so that my body can survive. It takes well over three hours to get my body back to a sensible temperature. And during this time, Susie never leaves me. She talks to me the whole time, constantly, pinching me, poking me, keeping me awake. Every time I drift off, she wakes me back up, talks to me some more. The physical pain during that four hours is some of the worst physical pain that I've ever experienced ever and I really genuinely don't ever want to experience again. You know when you go out in the snow and your hands get cold and you come back in and they start to warm up and as you move your fingers it hurts? Multiply that by a hundred and imagine every single piece of your body feels like that. It is the most unbelievably uncomfortable situation I've ever been in. I cried and I drifted in and out of consciousness for well over four hours. Once my body was stable, I was relocated to a relatively easy accessible bunk so that I could be kept an eye on, and Susie monitored me for the next 48 hours of secondary drowning, one of the biggest fears now because in the location that we were in, well over 2,000 miles for land, there is no treatment for secondary drowning and there is no evacuation. Every time I opened my eyes for the next 48 hours, Susie was on a beanbag next to me on the floor. She never left me once, she stayed with me the whole time. It's a selfless act of bravery and a massive commitment. After a couple of days, I managed to take some food and drink and make a satellite phone call to my friends and family back home, tell them I was okay and I was on my way to San Francisco. It took us about 10 days to get to San Francisco. When I arrived, I was somewhat surprised by the media for all that surrounded my arrival. I was whisked off to the hospital and checked over for a suspected broken leg, which turned out to be just very badly bruised. I spent six, day, six days in fairly intensive physio, getting me fit to get back on board the boat, which was always my intention. For me, clip around the world is called around the world for a reason, and I wasn't going to be ter- deterred from getting back on board. On the day that we left San Francisco, I felt physically sick. It was a very, very difficult day, much, much more difficult than anything else I'd experienced on the race. But I got myself through the day, I got myself into the next race, and I continued for the next three or four months and finished the race, circumnavigated the globe, and arrived back in London to meet my family, in particular my daughter Siobhan, who I hadn't seen for over a year. It was a pretty emotional day. There are many things on that day that could have ended differently. If the rudders had hit me anywhere other than the bottom of my legs, I wouldn't have been conscious, I wouldn't have been able to activate my AIS, I wouldn't have been able to look after my life jacket, I wouldn't have been able to check my dry suit. My dry suit kept me alive. Without a dry suit, one would not survive an hour and 40 minutes in those temperatures, in those waters. And actually, I'm surprised I did, even wearing a dry suit, given how cold it was. My AIS, however, saved my life. Without the AIS beacon, the boat would never have found me. When my signal was transmitted to the boat, I was some four and a half miles away, drifting at in excess of four knots. Given that I'd been in the water for an hour, that makes perfect sense. The boat thought I was drifting at about one knot, which is why they were searching where they were. In fact, I was drifting at four knots and was now over four and a half miles away. One of my concerns when my AIS was working was what its range was, what its battery life was. Again, I'm a bloke. I didn't read the instructions and I probably should have done. I decided when I got back, in discussion with Clipper, that there were a huge amount of lessons to be learnt from this experience. This experience is quite unique in that it's one of the first times AIS has been used to save somebody from a man overboard experience and it's probably one of the most remote and longest times in the water that a man overboard has occurred. So I decided I would write as many notes as I could and I wrote prolifically from the time I got back on the boat and we were starting to learn from these lessons so I continued to write. And then as story, the, the story grew 
and the, my notes grew and I spoke to more and more people, I became aware that I was only ever able to share an anecdote or a small soundbite. Even today, I've only shared part of the story. There is so much more involved in it. It's so much wider. It's so much greater. There are so many more people involved, all of whom I'm eternally grateful to. People often ask me if it was traumatic, and I say, maybe it was, but spare a thought for the crew on the boat that spend an hour and 40 minutes looking for me. Spare a thought for the skipper who's responsible for me. Spare a thought for the race director back home who has to telephone my family and tell them what's happening. My brother has to phone my father. My father has to phone my daughter. Those are traumatic. I do consider myself a very, very lucky boy to have survived this. It's changed me slightly. I have a much more positive outlook on life. I'm extremely lucky that I was wearing a dry suit, but I'm even more lucky that I was carrying an AIS beacon. The story is now captured in a book called 179 West named after the coordinates where the incident happened. My motivation for writing the book was twofold, to share the story so that people can experience all of it and perhaps learn from it, learn those lessons, and gather some of the information that's freely available now in this publication. But equally, perhaps do some good. I never set out to profit from writing the book, so all the book sales proceeds go to my two nominated charities, the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust and the Newmarket Day Centre in my hometown in Newmarket, Suffolk. I hope you enjoy reading the book, but equally, I hope that we can learn something from this, that we can develop AIS technology, we can develop marine safety technology, we can develop the way that people use it, the way that people think about it, the way that people carry it, the way that they consider how they might use it, and even if nothing else, learn from some of my comments about the fact that I hadn't read the instructions or the fact that I hadn't tested it or the fact that I hadn't trained with it. I was very lucky to be carrying it, but I was equally lucky that it worked and it saved my life.